So broadly continuing from where we left in the previous session, we're going to now touch upon how do I go about projecting capital expenditure for the company, right? So what do I do in terms of trying to predict what is going to be the uh, the the capex for the company in the next year? Now, two things around capex. One, basically, when companies announce capex, let's say you're saying I'm going to put up a new factory that produces 20,000 cars a year or 25,000 or 2 lakh cars a year, you are going to talk about that in cost terms, right? So you're going to talk about that in cost terms and cost terms basically means that you have to look at essentially what is called as the gross value of fixed assets because only the gross fixed assets show what was the historical cost. What you see here is the net fixed assets, the carrying value of the assets. This does not tell you what is the plant worth when they put it up. So when they announce a capex plan, you have to find out how much is the plant worth when they put it up. So what we do is we dig into the annual report and find out what is the gross value. That gross value of tangible assets and intangible assets is available in the notes to account. And so we put in that number here. Once we put in that number, that's when we start, uh, that's when we start uh, looking at this uh, this data and try and uh, work around uh, this. So now we have this data. Now this must have been the total historical cost of their capex when they had put up the factory and this for the year after that. So what we do is I divide it with the capacity number. So what is my capacity? My capacity is 15.5 lakh cars, 15.5 lakh cars. Obviously the number looks different because they might have front loaded some capacity which is some part of this capex might have actually come up earlier, right? So no way of ascertaining an exact amount in terms of what is the exact cost versus exact capacity at that point of time. Obviously this includes some part of the capex that was happening at a later point of time. So while the capacity did not come on stream, obviously capex takes a couple of years. So some part of that must have happened here itself, right? And so if I divide it, by the number of car, the company would need roughly about 98,000 or 1 lakh 20,000, let's say 1 lakh rupees of assets per car capacity. What does that mean? Basically, that means that in 2019, if I have to make an assumption, and let's say I make an assumption of 1 lakh, and I take 1 lakh because this 120 is, uh, is coming without the new assumed capacity that comes here. Right? If I assume that half of the capacity had come here, just argument's sake, if I had made this 16,500, 50,000, just argument's sake, if I had made it as that, and let's assume that the capacity added was kind of over a period of time, this number would have fallen to 113, right? So obviously just because the capacity did not come in on stream at that year doesn't mean the company did not do any capex and that obviously reflects that uh, because the denominator is stagnant, it appears to be a larger number. I'm going to put a number of about 1 lakh cars, 1 lakh rupees per car, right? Now, when the company says that it is going to add capacity by 250,000 in this year, right? 2 lakh 50,000 cars this year, what should be the total capex? For every car, effectively, you need 1 lakh rupees. So, capex on account of new capacity is 1 lakh multiplied by you can go up, 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 up the entire capacity addition and divide that by 10 raised to 6 to convert this to millions. So you will do about 25,000 million, 25 billion or 2,500 crore worth of capex next year, right? Logical. So roughly 2,500 crore of capex is needed in order to increase capacity by 2.5 lakh cars per annum. And we do know that their profitability is reasonably strong. They're expected to make about eight, nine thousand kind of profit, eight crore kind of profit each year. So this should easily be fundable from internal accruals itself. Doesn't look like they need to change their debt policy around it, right? Also note that if you look at their PNL and look at their sales number, that's nearly ninety thousand crore. Whereas if you look at their uh, balance sheet fixed asset number all put together is about 15,000 crore. So with 15,000 crore of asset, they generate 90,000 crore of sales. It's a fairly, what we say, asset light model. It doesn't need too much of assets to, to be able to run this business, right? So that consequently 
appears here that with just two and a half thousand crore they can increase their capacity by two and a half lakh cars a year and so that gives me the first part of the capex what is the next part of the capex now just think about it if a company does a little bit of wear and tear so even if you do not increase capacity if there's no change in capacity will the company do zero capex is there going to be zero capex at all points of time now that doesn't make sense right because honestly the company is going to probably see some wear and tear and so consequently every year any asset that has worn out you have to replace some of those assets you might not be adding capacity but you have to replace this now how do you find out wear and tear wear and tear there is a number that probably gives an estimate of that so you are worried about what's the depreciation in the year so a reasonable estimate could be that whatever was the depreciation last year so I can just look at this number and say depreciation in the previous year could be my wear and tear in this year. That's what I have to replace, right? So 2018 depreciation is available here. I'm going to plug that as the wear and tear number. So that's 2018 depreciation. 27,000 million or 27 billion is what we see. So total capex approximately that the company has to do is about 5000 odd crore rupees some part of it replacing the previous bit some part of it uh, adding new capacity right and obviously wear and tear could be higher or lower it depends on depreciation but we are going to probably assume that the company would do any kind of capacity enhancement any kind of uh, R&D expense etc is kind of included in that part that's not going to be significantly different, right? So what we assume is that this is going to be my capex for the year. If this is my capex for the year, the problem is we do not have this number. This number is not available, right? And that's not available because we don't have the annual report for 2018. And so there is no way at this point of time to find that number. We'll try and bypass this a little bit. So how do we bypass it? We'll leave this aside. We don't necessarily need it. Uh, Let's try and find out what would be depreciation each year. So let's put a depreciation number and let's find out in this particular case, because we do not have gross fixed assets for a one particular year, I'm going to find depreciation as percentage of last year net fixed assets. Just try and find that out. Right, so let's first link the depreciation number 2016 onwards from the PNL. So I'm going to link this, and that's my depreciation number. And now I'm going to divide this number with the previous year net fixed asset. So I don't have that number for 2015 net fixed asset. I only have that number for 2016. So the first calculation will happen in 2017. So I take the depreciation of the company and divide it by the sum of on the balance sheet the net fixed assets for 2016 tangible and intangible both of them right divide we get somewhere around 21 percent 20.8 percent right I can just drag it ahead I get 20.7 percent so it looks like a relationship there right which is the company tends to basically write off about 20 percent of their previous years net fixed assets in this year and so whatever is the net fixed assets in 2018 I can make an assumption for the depreciation for 2019 around that let's just put this as 20.7 that's an assumption so my depreciation for the year should be 20.7 percent multiplied by the sum of the net fixed assets in these two years and that's my depreciation so I can find the depreciation this year correct now what did we do we just assumed that whatever was the asset base last year 20.7 percent of that is going to create the depreciation so we get the depreciation number we can go and plug in this depreciation number in our PNL so I'm going to link this to 27760 depreciation plugs in there right now let's go back here and try and do two things one let's corroborate the data so we said about 5000 dot crore and Maruti says that they are going to have roughly 5000 dot crore data for you know this thing for capex last year they apparently spent 3400 crore but in the absence of you know definitive numbers we're not going to put that number in 
Now they're going to say core development, uh, core new product development, core operations, etc. And there's there's going to be some land purchase that they're going to do. So that's broadly that they're going to do. The capacity they call is somewhere around this 1.55 plus two and a half, and phase two will add another two and a half lakh, which is what we have assumed. Now think about it. You have net fixed assets for last year, right? For FY18. To this, you can add the capex. That's the new capacity, new addition to assets, right? And from this, you have to subtract the depreciation that year. And if you can do this, what you will find will be the net fixed assets for FY19, correct? That's what we're looking at. So let's go to the Excel file. What we are saying is that, go to the balance sheet, and I'm gonna make one more assumption here. What is capital work in progress? Capital work in progress is basically uh, the capex you are undertaking at this point of time, but has not yet finished. So even if you assume that this finishes next year, I'm going to put you can put this at zero. Once this finishes, this goes and sits in the fixed asset number. So it has to come and get added here. So what is going to be the number? I'm going to combine these two numbers now, right? So let's merge these two cells. I don't need tangible intangible. So that's going to be equal to last year numbers of these two plus this number so this year's net fixed assets are going to be this plus intangible last year's plus capital work in progress let's assume this is finished now whatever building they were building has been finished now right plus the capex this year so that's the capex number minus the depreciation remember you're looking at net fixed assets so whatever is the depreciation for that year has to be knocked off and that gives you the total number of long-term assets right now we have long-term assets with us we have most of the other data points with us what we don't have is cash estimates so i need to bring in the balancing figure from the cash flow and plug that number in and see whether my balance sheet balances or not there are a few more things that need to be done on the pnl statement you do see that interest cost is not available at this point of time so we need to plug in a number for interest cost now what is the interest cost that you're going to look at now again the problem with interest cost that we see is last year the number just spiked up the year before that was about 100 odd uh, crore kind of a number so i'm inclined to kind of stick to the number before the previous years last year seems to be an anomaly and honestly we need a dig digging into this number once the annual report is out because on a small debt you can't have uh, 300 crore of uh, interest so they must have probably taken debt in between so i'm going to stick this at 1000 and that's an assumption Right, so we stick that at 1000. Whatever we get, we get. We'll come back to the actual numbers, checking of those numbers in a bit, but that's the that's the amount of data that we see. That's the balance sheet numbers that we see. It obviously does not balance at this point of time because we do not have the balancing figure as yet. So we need to bring the balancing figure for which we will need the cash flow creation. So now we bring in our attention to how do we create the cash flows net profit is where we start indirect method of cash flow creation to this you add any non cash expenses such as depreciation you subtract any change in working capital and we've not yet calculated the working capital change we'll calculate that as well you'll subtract any capex and you will add any change in debt and primarily assuming that there is no dividend and I'll come back to that concept of why no dividend assumption here we will see the total cash flow for the here year as this we can look at what was the opening cash flow and then we can find out what is the closing cash flow right so for example last year closing cash flow can be plugged in from the balance sheet which is 740 this year opening cash flow is going to be 740 rest of the numbers we are going to plug in now right 
Do we know what is the net profit that's available on the PNL? I can plug that number in here. Do we know what is the depreciation that's available here? I can plug that number in here. Let's go and find out change in working capital. So here, how do you find change in working capital? Net working capital is basically non-cash current assets minus current liabilities. So I'm going to find out what is going to be my working capital. That's going to be equal to sum of all these current assets that are calculated here, non-cash remember, minus you know, sum of all the current liabilities. And so we do this. And that's my working capital, negative working capital scenario for this firm, which is good because obviously no receivables. That's the working capital. Change in working capital is this year number minus last year number. And so we see a negative number there, right? We are more interested in the number for 2019. So change in working capital, look at the 2019 number, that's 10,817, plug that there, correct? Now. CAPEX has to be reduced. So where is the CAPEX number? Let's go and look at the CAPEX number that's here in data and assumptions. Let's plug that here. Right. And there's no change in debt. So that's zero. So what's my cash flow for the year? A plus B minus minus 10,000. That's going to become positive and this number. Right. So what do we get? Net profit plus depreciation minus change in working capital minus capex. Change in working capital being negative gets added. And so we can also add just in case as a formula you want to add change in debt as well. That's zero in this case. So what is the closing cash flow that you get? So you get 56031. This is the number that has to go and sit in the balance sheet. If you have done everything correctly, the balance sheet should start balancing. So let's go there, plug in the number from the cash flow sheet, 56031, plug that in. Does the balance sheet balance? It does. Bingo. So here we find the balance sheet balancing. Once you put in the balancing figure, uh, which has been calculated from all the linkages that we have created. And so the cash flow seems to be working absolutely fine, right? This at this stage creates an entire model ready for us. Now we have the model ready in terms of its framework. All we need to do now is debate these yellow cells that we can debate, but the model per se is ready. Now what we do from here on is a very interesting and quick exercise. We're going to build this model till 2023, right? So I'm going to extend these by another couple of years. I'm going to do the same with ratios. And I'm going to extend that till 2023. Same with the cash flow. We're going to increase this till 2023. And in fact, beyond at some point. Balance sheet. Okay, balance sheet. Let's extend this here. I don't need 24. And same with PL. So PL extends it till 23. Correct. Now everything is linked in the in this sheet at this point of time. If everything is linked, then it must be a matter of largely copying and pasting this in subsequent cells. So what do I do? Just look at it carefully. I will copy this entire thing till the last cell. Control C and paste it. Control V, Control V, Control V, Control V till 2023. I can change the numbers as we go along, but we have pasted all these numbers here and that that works, right? If I go to the balance sheet now and do the same exercise of copying and pasting, then obviously what's going to happen is some parts of this are not going to work well. Let's do control V, control V, control V, control V. And we'll note that, you know, the balance sheet may not really balance. The balance sheet will not balance. Obviously, there are a lot of other things that are there that have to come in. For example, all your current assets are missing here. That comes in only once you basically go ahead to your PNL, copy the entire set of data on the PNL, do a copy here and paste all of that for the next five years. And now you see the balance sheet gets populated most of it at least. 
you still don't have the balance sheet balancing for that you need to drag this further so drag this by one year and so on and so forth and remove this obviously this has to become zero each of the year so that's the problem with dragging numbers that it some it excel just adds one sometimes to all these numbers and if everything was linked correctly in this scenario at this point of time we should see a balanced balance sheet so let's look at the balance sheet whether we have been able to reach a balanced balance sheet and yes the balance sheet is balancing the number of assets and liabilities are the same broadly telling us that the framework is completely matching there is no problem with this framework it's all fit and fine all we now need to go to is go to the data and assumption sheet and check our assumptions right now one method of checking your assumptions is look at the ratio sheet uh, because you have already calculated everything all you need to do is pull the ratios on the right side and see how the numbers are moving and now what you spot is your largest company in India is who has seen operating margins go up is seeing declining margins so we are ultra conservative on our numbers at this point of time that was also evident from the fact that your profits were actually falling all this while that doesn't make sense for a company that holds 50% market share has pricing power and has seen profit increase in the past in fact, most of the market expects a profit increase with this company. So ratios just give you a sense that, you know, something is amiss. We are we're probably just too conservative on some of these data points. If you think about company management like Maruti, you would at least expect that they would want to maintain margins, right? One of the things they would definitely want to do is maintain margins. So all your assumptions from here on, right? All your assumptions from here on are going to be basically assuming two things uh, your margins are going to remain stable or maybe even increase a bit your margins might even increase a bit that's because they've been showing that trend and I'll tell you why we are expecting margins to increase is because and in fact margins might increase because there is a new royalty agreement between Suzuki and Maruti and that's going to be beneficial for both the entities according to the new pattern royalty payment of Maruti has been dealing from the fluctuations in the currency market positive one right also after sales of a certain model reaches a threshold that is to be said by the parent royalty will come down that's positive two currently they pay about five to five point five percent of sales as royalty right that's expected to come down because once the threshold reaches a certain point that's going to work there and the company is expecting uh, that the automatic royalty will get reduced and that's where uh, this has already been approved uh, we might have a question that what is the company going to do with the electric vehicle threat that comes in so that is also kind of here Suzuki will reimburse the money that Maruti spends for R&D work in India that will strengthen the books of its subsidiary so to that extent if the company makes extra spending on R&D towards electric vehicle or new technologies that's going to be reimbursed so in our model we don't need to take a hit on that regard we can go back to our model and try and look at uh, the numbers in that regard what we are going to assume obviously in terms of our data and assumptions is that margins are going to remain constant now two things we'll add here I'm going to in incorporate a sort of a cell here where I will assume a growth in domestic market itself and growth in exports right and this is in percentage terms we assumed a 10% growth here and a 10% growth here that's what we had assumed here right if you look at these numbers we had just multiplied them directly now what we're going to do is we're going to decline this because the market once it becomes bigger obviously we'll see a slightly lower growth and then let's actually convert all of this to percentages first and I'm going to assume a slightly declining growth here of 8% and then 6% over the next two years that's the domestic market remember right for exports however I'm probably going to assume an increase because India is expected to become an export hub right now obviously 
once india becomes an export hub suzuki will also want to take advantage of that which would result in a certain amount of volume getting created over this period right that's the assumption we are working with in terms of the number of cars that are there capex that you see here i don't think the last year capex is necessary from that regard that the company basically looks at some of these numbers in broad sense that you would want to reach capacity here the problem with putting capex in the last year of your evaluation model is that it will kind of put your cash flows lower in the last year and that affects all your calculation of future numbers as well right so that uh, is not needed we are going to leave it here and we are going to assume these kind of volumes in fact honestly i think we are a little bit aggressive on the overall volumes that the company might have so we might want to kind of uh, think about what kind of uh, what kind of numbers the company is going to kind of show and uh, domestically i think 25 lakh cars is what their target is uh, in the next few years so that's where we are they are planning to give to 20 lakh by 2020 which we have assumed here they are probably going to go to 24 25 26 somewhere around uh, 2023 and then stay there because obviously you can't keep growing at that rate as you go along there could obviously be a small change in market share numbers as well as we go along in terms of pricing i don't see a reason why maruti given a their pedigree in the market b their premiumization that they are doing why their ratios should see a declining trend in all probability i think they should stabilize these numbers around 16 17% kind of margins so i'm going to assume a 5% jump followed by a 4% kind of a jump in subsequent years in fact my sense is we might even be conservative here so it takes it up to 16 odd percent and then kind of declines it back to 15 i don't think it's going to go below where it is right now so maybe we continue with 5% for another couple of years and then last few years i don't want it to kind of go and uh, uh you know create a challenge in terms of what the numbers are in fact initial few years as they kind of change the product mix we could see a slightly better tick there right then you look at costs here uh, interestingly some of the cost assumptions we have made may not be that aggressive so for example employee cost beyond a certain set of years might just be at 6% and now whatever happens with the company as large a size as maruti what we are probably going to see is that if any cost goes up if any cost goes up the company should be able to pass on input cost rise right with their size and scale they should be easily able to pass it on to uh, to the end consumer so what we are betting on is that if raw material cost goes up by 6% then that number has to also go up on the pricing part effectively so that the company kind of maintains its margins that's our broad assumption that we have kept we might still be conservative given the kind of trajectory of growth that uh, that this company has seen in terms of working capital assumptions i think we are broadly fine this is a negative working capital company and we have kind of assumed that in fact in years before this year they were doing far more if you look at this negative number this gets added to the cash flows right we have actually been conservative here some of the numbers have actually gone down so if i actually take some of the numbers down further for example i take inventories down to 3.9% and then subsequently a little bit lower each year right that could happen till a certain period and then it could stabilize at 3.7 then in that case we would see a slightly better number what was 12000 becomes 13000 now right so what gets added to your cash flows could get boosted further from them managing working capital better we've actually and they've been doing it in the past we have assumed a a slightly lower take here right with the kind of clout that they have with the kind of pricing power that they have and market share that they have they should be fairly comfortable trying to get these numbers in future i think um, capex wise we are fine broadly looks okay in terms of what depreciation is and what capex is and the thing you need to check is to kind of have a slightly higher production their net fixed assets need to go up and then to keep constant production net fixed assets need to stay where they are that's an important yardstick that you would want to use in terms of your calculation of the company's numbers that's what we have done so all the numbers are basically available 
we have the cash flows which are available with us we can now go ahead and actually discount these cash flows in terms of our numbers right so let's actually bring these cash flows down once again and I'm gonna put this and I'm gonna put this here let's find out what is the growth rate and that's an important yardstick because for some of the years the growth rate could be huge and then we suddenly assume that the company kind of goes down right so that doesn't make sense so we probably need to assume a certain amount of growth here and uh, play along with that as we go along uh, so I'm going to assume it for another five years we're going to extend this model but only growth in the cash flow is what we are going to assume and I'm going to taper it down quickly so 15% going to 10% and then maybe 8% 6% and 6% that's the growth rate in the cash flows that we are assuming right and you dig it further take it there that's your total set of the number and I have projected or increased this number till 2028 in that context right now beyond this year you're going to see what is the terminal calculation you assume that this is a going concern so you're going to see a terminal value calculation I'll quickly show you how do you look at the terminal value calculation the exact formula derivation will probably be beyond the scope of this video but you take your cash flow in the last year you multiply it with a certain growth rate and you divide it by the cost of equity minus that growth rate this is the terminal value in the last year right so if 2028 is the last year we are going to go to 2028 and this value will be in 2028 for that we need two more assumptions so I'm going to assume a terminal growth rate and I'm going to assume a discount rate for the time being let's just assume the discount rate to be 13 percent and terminal growth rate to be 5 percent right the discount rate will come back to but the terminal number is going to be this into 1 plus G which is 5 percent divided by 13 minus 5 right that's my terminal value I can actually look at the cash flows at this point of time and just put all of them here and the last year cash flow remember 2028 is going to be this plus the final terminal value correct I need to now find the present value so these are my cash flows present value of cash flows is what I have to find how do I do that this divided by 1 plus the rate at which I'm going to discount freeze the rate raise to the power and how do I find the number of years that I have to discount by so 2019 the first one is going to get discounted by one year 2019 minus 2018 correct and I can freeze this so that's raised to the power 1 close bracket that's my discounted value I can pull it all the way up to the end and that's all my values put together right that is all the sum of my values put together which bring us to this value we'll come back to this we'll come back to this let's just add up all the present values of the cash flows and that adds up to the sum of all of these put together and what's that number that's the number we are getting right now let's dig a little bit deeper in terms of trying to find out what this discount rate should be what do you think the discount rate should be so the discount rate calculation and before we go there we also need to find out what is the number of shares that Maruti has so number of shares that Maruti has is about 30.2 crore shares 30.2 crore shares or 302.8 of 5 rupees each face value so that's the 151 crore share capital number that you see on the balance sheet right that's the number you see on the balance sheet that's your number of shares that are existent so I can find that out now let's calculate the the cost of equity for these guys and that's going to be risk free rate plus beta into RM minus RF right so I need to calculate what is the risk free rate risk free rate typically 
theoretically speaking, is zero coupon bond yield. You can find this out as well. That's available. There's a place where you can find it. But for simplicity sake, I'm going to assume 10 year bond yield, right? So India 10 year bond yield currently is about 8%, right? But this 8% is a very recent move. If you see uh, in the last couple of months, it has basically just spiked up from 7.2 to 7.9. That's because of the near term movement in crude prices, currency, etc. that have happened. It does not necessarily tell you that it is a correct number. So and that after it has actually increased from 6.4 all the way up to 8, right? You can't change this number on a day to day basis. So I'm going to take the midpoint of somewhere between this, which is going to be 7.5 to 7.6 percent. The yield could easily fall tomorrow depending on what numbers come up. So I'm going to be restricting it to 7.5 to 7.6 percent. That's my risk free rate. Right, risk free rate. That's RF. Now I need to find beta and I need to find RM minus RF. So let's first find beta. What do you mean by beta is nothing but uh, a sort of a regression that you're doing between the returns of Maruti and the returns of Nifty. Right, that's how you statistically calculate beta. In fact, if you want to kind of calculate beta statistically, all you are saying is that this is your y axis. That's your x axis. That's your stock. Right, so that's my stock and this is my market and on any given day you will have a plot that you can create based on you know, there'll be a two dimensional point the line that best represents this relationship. The slope of that line is what is going to be your beta, right? You can run a regression as well. And the slope of that line is going to give you that beta. Let's uh, let's run the regression uh, in Excel. You can simply use a formula that's available. There are in fact multiple ways you can do it. You can also use a formula of covariance upon variance covariance between the returns of the market and the asset and divide by variance of the market. But simply put, you can just find a function called slope known wise y is equals to so let's write the equation down that's y equals to mx plus c right i need to find m which is the slope the stock moves y moves m times x the stock moves beta times market right so in the slope the y data point is the stock the x data point is the market and that's your beta 1.16 right that's over a two year period. I can also try and find it out over a one year period. And that's because that's a more real near term reflection. And that one year would be from let's say June 2017. Uh, somewhere around 9th June all the way up to down and comma. You go back up to 9th June. here all the way up to down close. So last year beta is about 0.96. I would be tempted to assume the beta to be 0.96 because it doesn't look like a risky business, right? It's not as risky as what the numbers appear to be showing. The beta probably reflects the fact that the stock went up from 4000 to 8900 where the nifty only went up about you know, 25 odd percent during that period. The stock has gone up more than 100 percent. And so obviously it's moving more than the market. And that reflection is probably distorting the beta a little bit, but it looks more like a steady business. And so I wouldn't genuinely be inclined at keeping the beta numbers beyond 0 0.95, 0 0.96. So that's my beta. And then I come to the market risk premium, which is RM minus RF. Now there are multiple ways of finding this out as well. I'm using one of those. You can use others as well. So what do I take is I take Sensex year ending values from 2001 and I take the value for 2018 as the last value that is available. I'm assuming the year will end here. Now I don't know what is the cycle so I can't really take this and calculate it all the way up to here. So I calculate returns over a reasonably long period. That's a rolling 10 year period return. 
So this one is 2001 to 11, then you have 2002 to 12 and 3 to 13. These are your returns, right? Annualized, annualized return, 10 year period. So you did very well till 2015, but in 2016, 2017, your returns got depressed because those were the peak years of the previous bull run. If I take a simple average, my market return is about 12.73, which is just an average, a simple average function of all these on Excel will give me this. If I do a geometric average, which is basically one plus R, one plus R, one R2, one plus R3, note that because these are returns and they are compounded, Ideally, you should be doing a geometric average. So how do you do a geometric average? You first add one to all the returns, take a product of all of these up to n, then find the nth root of, of this and then subtract one. So you multiply all of these because these are eight years of data. You divide, you, you know, find the eighth root of that and subtract one. The number actually comes very similar. It doesn't change in this particular case. So your return from the market historically has been approximately 12.5 to 13 percent. This is RM, right? So RM minus RF is probably about 5.5 percent. Can I put these numbers in? I will go to the Excel file and I'm going to start putting in some of these numbers. Let's just insert one, two, three rows. I'm going to put risk free rate. I'm going to put beta. I'm going to put market premium. So what's my risk free rate? 7.5%. What's my beta? That's 0 0.95. Right, I'm going to put 0 0.95. And what's my market premium? 5 point, in fact, 5.25% exactly to be precise. Let's calculate the number. That's going to be RF plus beta into RM minus RF, which is this, that gives me the number as 12.49%. I've assumed a 5% growth in terminal case. That's because terminally the Maruti stock should grow at something lesser than the economy growth, which you would assume that in nominal terms will be about 7 to 8% till infinity. So Maruti should grow at 4, 5% probably, and you can play around with that number. This is the present value of all the cash flows right this however remember ignores something and what does that ignore it ignores other income why does it ignore other income they could have generated other income based on their cash holdings but there are two problems around this entire thing so we left out two things one we left out other income two we left out dividends now we left out dividends because what you saw here is nothing but free cash flow to equity and when you are doing free cash flow to equity analysis, you are assuming this is an extension of dividend discount model. Remember, you are assuming that these cash flows are paid out. If they are paid out, they can't go and sit again in the company. If they can't sit again in the company, they can't build cash balances in the company. If they can't build cash balances in the company, the company's other income cannot go from where it is. So that resolves the logic of why we are not using that. We already assumed that these are being paid out. So whether dividend gets paid out or dividend doesn't get paid out in FCFE, you anyway adjust again for it. So to that extent, you don't need to worry too much about it, right? So we will anyway, if we, if we had assumed a dividend payout to find the cash flow for FCFE, we would have had to add that dividend back. So we did not bother too much about projecting dividends, right? If you're building a complete model, you may want to do that. The second thing why we removed other income is that this is probably coming from cash, right? This income is coming from cash. Now, what you are finding out in your cash flow and that's getting discounted at this discount rate is cash flow from business assets. Other income is coming from cash is that is cash flow from cash assets. Now the risk of cash is not the same as risk of your business, right? So I can't take the other income component of Maruti and discount that at 12 and a half percent. I should be discounting that at risk free rate because that is risk free. Even if they don't do any business, that 34,000 crore of cash that they have today is going to give them a certain amount of return risk free, right? 
So it has to be discounted at 7.5%. You can't discount that at 12.49%. So rather than actually adding that scale, what we assume that take the cash outside the business. So we take cash outside the business, value the business, right? Value the business and add back cash. Can I add back the cash now? So what does the cash that the company hold equal to on the balance sheet 2018 value, right? So you have 2018 values. There are three line items, current investments plus cash and bank balances plus non-current investments. Recall that non-current investments were investments in debt. That's what we saw in their balance sheet. So you put that up. That's your value for the company. And that will give you a certain total equity value for the company. I can add these two. Do we know the number of shares? Do we know the number of shares? That's 30.2 crore or 302.08 million, right? That was the number of shares we saw on the, on the file. So can I find a per share value? And I can find the per share value by dividing A by B. I find that the stock should be valued at about 7,772 rupees. The current market price, if I'm not wrong, is about 8,900. So just purely based on this first cut DCF analysis that we have done, it appears that this is overvalued, right? That this seems to be overvalued at the current price point. The per share value probably should be about close to 8,000. It's trading at close to 9,000. That's remember, however, based on a first cut analysis, if for example, the market is believing that interest rate should go to 6.5%, then the number changes, right? So maybe the market is expecting the correct interest rate in the long run should be 6.5% and the rest of the assumptions match, right? So that's one thing. Let's just do a little bit of interesting calculation here. Uh, we can also go back and assume the company's uh, numbers based on what you see. So that's the DCF valuation. I will now quickly go ahead and touch upon what is going to be relative valuation. So can I find EPS earnings per share? So this divided by the number of shares, which was available on our cash flow sheet. And I'll freeze that. So 270 and all the way up to 311, 379 and so on and so forth, right? Those are the numbers we have assumed. Note that these numbers do not include other income. If I just add for the, for the purpose of this analysis, I just add this 20,000 here and kind of keep adding this 20,000 each of the years, the numbers will change. So we get 320, 360 kind of a number based on that and 360, next year earnings multiplied by about 25 times is going to give me approximately 8,950 as the price. This does not include the cash per share, right? I will go to the cash flow and I'll also try and find out cash per share value. So I can take this cash and I can divide it by this. So nearly every share has an embedded value of 1200 rupees of cash at this point of time, the cash that they hold, right? So technically 1200 rupees cash per share, 25 times the stock should trade next year earnings, whatever that earnings is. And so sometimes you will see a target of roughly about 9,000, 10,000, right? If you want to elaborate and check, you can also do a simple Google search on uh, consensus estimates for Maruti. And I've taken two of them, Reuters and Bloomberg. So look at EPS estimates 326 and 386 in our calculation we were getting 316 and 360 approximately roughly thereabouts there are obviously the range of estimates so the lowest estimates are these and the highest estimates are these this includes 42 analysts who have given this if you look at uh, the consensus estimates before the December quarter results for the uh, so this is FY17, 339 and 396 
as per Bloomberg. So Bloomberg says 339, 396. I think this has gone down marginally after the latest results, marginally after the latest results, because last quarter results, their margins were hit a little bit. Right. So that basically gives you the overall uh, context of uh, of data around your valuation, whether you use uh, DCF or whether you use uh, you, you use uh, relative valuation. My sense is a stock like Maruti should trade at 25 to 27 times in any case. And that basically proves your overall number of what comes there. Now, a lot of the things here are assumptions. So, for example, this is an assumption. Uh, you are assuming risk free rate and some of these data points. There is more theory available around this. If you want to read, you can go to Professor Damodaran's website and there's a number around market premium available every year. And that varies between numbers here or there. So my sense is whenever you do valuation of a stock, you should look at 1% lower discount rate and 1% higher discount rate. So anything between 11.5%, which gives you 9,000 rupees of value and 13.5% which gives you somewhere around 7,000 rupees per share value. That's your range of values that you can basically play around with or justify for a stock like Maruti. That's broadly it in terms of our discussion. Let's quickly do a recap. What we are doing is we are trying to build a quick sort of framework with respect to how do you build a valuation model right? You are obviously going to put in a lot of assumptions, but your primary assumption is that Maruti should be able to keep margins stable and slightly higher. What that means is that your numbers on costs and prices move in tandem, either go up or go down together. So if there is a cost increase, they're going to pass that on in terms of a price increase as well. Right. You are also making an assumption, keeping in mind the industry leading position of Maruti. And you know that any kind of R&D effort is going to get reimbursed for them by the parent. Electric vehicles is a sort of a risk that exists for them. But given that Suzuki lineage comes, they should be given their distribution network and the trust and the brand that they have. It is unlikely that Maruti would be one of the last or late entrants into that market. So if electric vehicles make a dent, it is fairly possible that Maruti could be one of the first players to do that. That might actually increase their industry leadership rather than kind of make it lower. They could also become an export hub. So there is a potential from that perspective as well that is playing out. That said, some of the other risk factors that exist are domestic, you know, market share could get threatened at some point of time, although history doesn't suggest uh, that that could happen. So that's a possibility you need to keep an eye on as you look at it. Remember, the idea of this is to, as I said, build a framework around your entire valuation scheme and not to become a definitive guide of valuation. This, what you see here, is a guide to help you. It's a tool to help your mind, right? You are the analyst. The model is helping you. It's not the other way around. So the model can be wrong. It has to guide you towards a process where you can dig deeper on these numbers, read up on the industry, read up on the company, and change the numbers that you put in these yellow cells. As you read a little bit more about the company, the numbers get more and more refined. You can go back and check these numbers and try out whether that made sense one year down the line or so or not. There can be more refinements to this model, which obviously is beyond the scope of this simple presentation that we did. There are definitely many more stages that can come in this kind of a model that you're building. But as a start, what is necessary is we understand, we interpret a fully functional model. We are able to build a completely balancing balance sheet. The cash, which is a balancing number, has to come from the cash flow. It cannot be a direct entry, hard-coded entry, right? So if you change anything in this model right now, any of these cells, which are assumptions, if you change them, you will eventually find a balanced balance sheet. That is a working model. That is a completely functional model. And that was our idea of this particular session. So that's broadly it in this session. Always remember a model will have limitations. 
so you can build further on this and this needs to act as a guide to help you build a business case what is more important is that you understand the business excel is the relatively easier part here right that's broadly it in the session today thank you